For more than three decades, Jack Anderson, a fifth generation Nanaimo resident, has been encouraging a more sustainable approach to homes and communities. His educational background includes architecture, urban planning, and ecological community design. Jack draws on two decades of experience with provincial and local government agencies, including the city of Nanaimo's first planning department, and later as a park planner. His behind-the-counter career has also included many years with the Regional District of Nanaimo's Building Inspection and Planning Departments. Jack brings a vast array of knowledge and experience to his many clients, and with his Green Plan team, he has designed more than 600 residential and commercial buildings since his first pass of solar home in 1985. His passion is to create green homes and sustainable communities throughout Vancouver Island. Let's welcome Jack Anderson from Nanaimo. Here he is tonight. Earth Day um, is started about 50 years ago with a oil spill down in the California area and people came out to protest that. And so one day a year we devote ourselves to Earth Day and I think we probably got that backwards. Maybe it should be one day a year we don't think about the Earth and the other 364 we focus on. So, so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to explain a little bit about who I am, uh, how I got here, what motivates me and some of my optimism for the future because it wasn't always there. Um, I was uh, bridging between the dual disciplines of planning and, and design and uh, have, have lived in all of that and so my good fortune was is that uh, back in 1985 I was the manager of a project on renewable energy in the regional district in Nanaimo and I was learning all about the different forms of renewable energy coming out of my university background. Um, one fellow walked up to me and said, wow, this is pretty impressive. Would you design me a passive solar home? And I went, sure. I did that in my undergraduate schooling. So I designed a passive solar home in 85 and uh, it was very exciting because it took us some time to get a building permit with the regional district in Nanaimo because they wanted us to put a heating system in it. And I said, well, we've got the sun and a small wood stove for the coldest of days. Um, but they insisted, so a heat pump was added to the plans, and uh, the owner gave me a big wink two years later when I ran into him on the streets in Nanaimo, and he says, I've never thrown the breaker on the heat pump yet. So <laughs> we were really, really happy with that. So you can see some of these images here, some of the projects that I've been involved with over the last two, three decades uh, as I've been exploring, finding my passion for sustainability. There's uh, images of Arno's place. Uh, there's the graphic that we prepared on the top and then the image that Arno sent me after it was over. And this one shows all the solar panels on Arno's house, which I find very impressive because of course it's very nice when you're going off the grid there. So here's a couple of houses that uh, I've been involved in the construction of it. And I'll just very quickly uh, point them out. The one on the left is actually an off-the-grid cabin on the west coast of the island in a place called Salmon Beach. Unfortunately, they brought the grid to my community there, but my cabin out there remains uh, unconnected to the grid, and I don't feel I'll need it. Um, the one in the top right is actually my own residence, and uh, in there you'll see that I've experimented with rooftop gardens, passive solar sun spaces, solar panels for hot water, solar panels for PV, gray water recycling systems, uh, rainwater collection. And so I've tried to find some of that myself, including permaculture gardens so that we could grow as much of our own food as we possibly could. The bottom image there is a very unique home and uh, Arno and his wife uh, Linda had a chance to go visit it. That home is 100% rainwater harvested. So there is no other source of water for that home and they have not only met all of their basic needs including purification for the purposes of uh, their drinking water and meeting Canadian drinking water standards but in addition to that they grow 5,000 pounds worth of vegetables in their permaculture gardens at the same time using rainwater harvesting only and have not run out on that. So I find that very very exciting in there. They are also a net zero home as is Arno and Linda. So over the years what I started to do is I went out to meet with people they would come to me and say hey I would like a green residence and, and so we would pull up this list and this is a very 
old list now. This is probably two decades old of what I call patterns of green. And so I list in there all the different green principles that we could consider incorporating into a residence. And they would go through and we would look and determine which ones were feasible and which ones may not make some sense right now and could be something that could be added in the future. So this gave me some sort of a direction here on how to work with my clients. But what was really important here was I was learning about technology and understanding that as technology improved, new green principles became available for us. And I think that's really exciting. And it's something I'm gonna share a little bit more of here in the moment, because I really think we're at a tipping point in terms of technological advancements. There's so much going on on this planet now. But you know, there's another tipping point that we're dealing with and Trevor spoke about it and, and it was something that I had as my awakening. In undergraduate school, I had the opportunity to see the Limits to Growth video by the Club of Rome out of MIT in 1970. I was shocked, I, was, I couldn't believe growing up on this pristine island that I could go and discover that if we don't make changes, we are gonna see serious problems in the future. And so now we see that. And so when we look at this, you know, we start to recognize what the impacts are. You know, we, in December, we had the worst windstorm we've ever had on this island. I lost power for four and a half days and I'm in a semi-urban area. You know, some people lost it for weeks at, at end. So windstorms are gonna get worse 2025. Look at the type of uh, uh, flooding that we're going to deal with in the future. The, the wildfires that have happened down in California, taking out whole communities, you know, and then we discover here in BC that we're susceptible to those same types of, of wildfires. This, what's it going to be like in 2030? Are we going to have more examples of just how tough and difficult that's going to be for the people that are alive on this planet at that time in this part of the world? What about 2040? That could be really scary. Look at that bottom image there. I think that's sort of somewhat ironic when you see the stop sign and you can barely read the word stop there because it's flooding. We need to stop. So what's it gonna be like in 2050? You know what? I probably shouldn't give a shit because quite honestly, in 2050, I'm probably dead, and if I'm not, I'm not sure all the cells will be working in there and everything will be So 2050 shouldn't be anything of concern for me, right? Well, take a look at these fellas. Guess what? Those little guys will all be in their mid-30s in 2050, and we're going to be passing on our environmental debt to them to deal with. And you know what? Those were my grandsons. So now you know what motivates me to create change. And I look around this room and I'm sure every one of you have got pictures in your wallets of your grandchildren and great grandchildren that are coming. And we gotta make this change. We gotta do that for their sake. Not because we're gonna be here in 2050 when things are chaos. They are and we've got to try and make it as best we can. So Paul Hawken came out with a book, and if anybody gets depressed worrying about things, read Paul Hawken's book. It pulled me right out of depression because what he had discovered was everywhere he went and gave lectures talking about trying to make change, people came forward and said, hey, our little group is doing this, we're doing that. And what he discovered was is there's this groundswell of change and it's coming from the bottom up. This isn't waiting for government to come in with regulations and say we must go green. This is about a groundswell and who powers that? Where's it all coming from? It's coming from here, it's our heart. It's all of us thinking about our grandchildren and what we need to do for them. So it's a movement that isn't gonna stop as long as we have offspring and they've got offspring, we're gonna be there for them. This is very exciting. Another great book for inspiration is Rob Hopkins' work with the Transition Handbook and he talks about the end of suburbia moment when you realize that, hey, guess what? That isn't the way that we should be living where we got to separate all of the requirements in our life. So we got to drive to go get food and we got to drive for recreation and we got to drive to work and we got to drive to entertainment. 
Suburbia never made sense. It didn't make sense back in the 50s, but that's when fuel was cheap and that was the way the planners thought to go. So now we've learned we got to reverse that. We got to bring all the basic needs and bring them back home. Rob Hopkins talks about a gift that we as a species have got. And that gift is creativity and imagination. We have the ability to think up solutions to our own problems. That is something that's very special. And one of them that's really important is the concept of resilience. And so resilience is all about being able to deal with what the future is, to be able to allow our systems to continue to operate when we're faced with shock. And that's what we're going to see in the future, whether it's climate or whether it's uh, resource depletion or as Trevor shared with us, the, the loss of all of the other species that we're related to on this planet. So it's really important that we think about resilience. And now in here, I've identified what many consider to be the three major consequences or impacts of climate change, drought, high temperatures, and storms. And so we here are very, very fortunate in a way, and this is a real quick slide here to point out that in the northern hemisphere, the way the earth rotates, it causes the energy that is created in the equator to travel in the northern hemisphere in a clockwise direction which means that in Asia, they get those same storms that they get in Florida that runs up through the Carolinas and barely reaches into Canada. But for us on this coast, those winds, those horrific winds cool down as they go through Siberia. And by the time they're circling back down over Vancouver Island, we're no longer giving names to the hurricanes. You know, they're just a wind for us. So what does that mean when we're living here in this very special spot in the world? If I was living in the Carolinas and I've had the third hurricane come through and blow my house off the foundation, I'm not sure I'm gonna to wanna to build it there anymore. I'm gonna think, I'm gonna look and see where is another place that we could move to. And guess what? They're all looking at our island here. They're looking at this coast. They're looking at Washington State and Oregon. This is where people are gonna to move to. So we're gonna see a mass immigration of people who want to move here and share what we're all gifted with here now. And I think that's really important to understand because it's a huge impact for us on what, this, what it's gonna be like here. And ultimately, mass immigration is gonna have a massive strain on our resources. What about things like our forests and our ability to build houses for all those people that want to move here? How are we going to deal with that? So I say we need a new approach to creating human habitat that is both sustainable and resilient. And so part of what that is, is that I want to go back and look at what the basic needs are. What are, what do we really just need? And many of our grandparents lived self-sufficient in the, in the woods, but their standard of living wasn't where we're, where we're at now. And so therefore, we have a need to make sure that we still have that high standard of living that we're familiar with, but we're not going to be that difficult on our planet. We're not going to have a huge footprint. We need to reduce it. So here's the basic needs that we're dealing with here. Clean air. That's one that's really important for us. Fortunately, we've got the Pacific, which does a great job of filtering the air that comes to us. So rarely do we have the kind of problems that we see in Asia and places where there's great pollution and stuff there. But we do get uh, those uh, horrific firestorms with all of that smoke and we get inversions. And so we've coughed and, and choked and, and uh, struggled around our island here as well. Shelter, huge. If you're homeless, you know, that might be your house. That might be the best you've got, but at least it hides you from the elements. So shelter is a critical piece that we have to find the basic needs for. Energy, solar opportunities. We're moving into a solar revolution, an opportunity to get as much of our energy from the sun as possible and power our vehicles the same way. Water becomes important. How do we conserve our water so we're not wasting it all the time? I look around this room and I can say that I think we're all a bunch of Jed Clampets in this room. 
We get this gift from the sky all the time, more than we want most of the time, but we have lots of water we can work with here. Food, what's our ability to grow it locally so that it is accessible and that we're not having to import things from all over the planet to get here so that we can uh, subsist? We have to manage our waste. We have to think about what we're doing with resources. And when we recognize it from a permaculture perspective, every waste product is an opportunity to use it in another, for another purpose. Think about repurposing. That's a critical approach to it. And then I think the last one is companionship. We need to have other people around us. I don't know those that are familiar with that TV show called Alone, where they were taking these survivalists and throwing up in the north end of Vancouver Island. I liked it because I used to kayak up in that part of the world. And they would drop them in there and these people would go around trying to get as much food as they could and build themselves a little shelter. But eventually they pressed the button and said, hey, take me out of here. I got nobody to talk to and it's killing me. You know, companionship is what we need as well in a human. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of these things uh, very quickly here. So um, air, as I said, I think we're very lucky here. We rarely have situations where our air is, is challenging, but we can certainly think about what we can do with our interior environments, our ability to grow food and to get fresh air from that, aromas from the plants that grow in there, etc. Shelter, this is the critical one right here. This is the one where we can really make a difference. And uh, in this situation, I have to, to look at this just biofiber product because this, for someone who's been in this business for as many decades as I and has been waiting for something that could change the world, this product here, I believe, is on its way to becoming a revolution in itself. Because it has so many attributes in here that are of value for us from a, a sustainable and from a resilient perspective. So the owner did two amazing things. First of all, let's not be confused and think that hemp and lime coming together is something that we just thought of. Hemp and lime are in the Great Wall of China and they're in the pyramids. So they've been around forever. But what Mac Radford did, the, the brilliance of this man, is he figured out a structural system that would allow it to work within the BC building codes. So that's a huge piece for us that he figured that out and he looked at it at a molecular level to figure out what are the binders that would hold it all together so it doesn't crumble during construction and stuff. Brilliance on his part. And of course, he put it together with simplicity. Does that look like your kid's Lego box or what? You know, all right down to the, the eight bumpers and the six bumpers and the four bumpers. That's the way we called it at my household. And there's so many unique things that we can work with this because of the way it breathes and stuff as well. I know I'm skipping over some of this. Here's a page from the website for Just Biofiber and it just talks about some of the natural attributes of it and it's quite busy uh, in there. But I want people to note at the bottom, justbiofiber.com. You must go to that website. They've got some amazing information in there, including, um, uh, some, some terrific videos and, and some of Arno's house uh, being constructed as well, which is really cool. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a couple of the attributes of just biofiber here. Uh, affordable, easy to use, uh, non-toxic materials. That's a huge aspect in there for people so that they can live in that house. And, and one of the neat things with it is, is that um, it, it allows it to breathe. And so uh, we don't have to have the hum of heat recovery ventilator happening in there. And we don't have to worry about uh, moisture building up in there or, or uh, um, uh, uh, mold or, or anything else happening. It's extremely strong construction, stronger than concrete. We can stack these blocks up eight stories uh, on this basic construction here right now. So it gives us opportunities for the, um, being able to go into multifamily. And these two here, Fireproof and sound resistant are critical. 
In the BC Building Code, if you are going to build a multifamily building, you have to have fire separation between the dwelling units. You have to have sound resistance between the building units. So just biofiber is, is like it's custom made for multifamily buildings. When you go to multifamily and you can go into attached housing, that reduces the cost of construction for the people that are going to live there. And as a consequence then, we're going to make this into affordable housing. Breathable membrane, I spoke to that. The high thermal resistance, this is really, really exciting. And I can tell you that we didn't even know what the R value was in Arno's house on these blocks. And Arno has gone and put sensors in the wall, both for humidity and for temperature, so he can track that. And one of the things we've learned is, is that depending on the weather conditions of the day, the R value changes. And if I understand it correct, we're at a minimum of about an R40, and we're going up to R48, Arno? Is that the highest that you've... Uh... I, I don't actually know the latest. Okay, okay, but it's in that area. So 10 and a half inch thick walls are giving us like north of R40 in there. In the BC Building Code, a standard two by six wall is R20. You want the higher the number, the better. So we get a super insulated building when we do this. So this is a massive opportunity for us in here. And of course, it's carbon negative. So while I talk about the importance that we do things to reduce climate change and carbon emissions, we're also thinking about this from a resilience perspective as well. And that's the other huge factor, the resilience and longevity of it. There's a picture of Arno's place right there with the solar panels on it again. And I have to question whether this is the potential here to be a revolution in the construction industry. And one of the critical reasons I say that here, and particularly here, we're talking about lots and lots and lots of people coming here that are going to lean on our forests to build their homes. But what if we jumped up in advance on that and we started growing industrial hemp? In Alberta, you need 10,000 acres of industrial hemp to run one factory and one factory capable of producing enough blocks for 30 houses in a month. Here on Vancouver Island, we don't need 10,000 acres. We only need 5,000 acres for a factory. The reason is, is that here we can get two rotations on Vancouver Island because of our climate. So we could, if we started growing industrial hemp on this island, we could be creating just biofiber factories up and down the island to meet the needs of the incoming people and ourselves, our families that are growing up and giving them a good place as well. So energy, if we reduce the energy loss of our building, then the energy we need for heating becomes less. And so in this situation, as long as we are using things like just biofiber, we're in a unique situation that we can start to use renewable energies to meet all of our energy requirements within that home as well. It becomes that much easier for us. And as Arno is proving, um, with his solar panels on there, we have a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to be uh, not only carbon negative, but net zero and putting money in the bank uh, to offset your initial upfront costs. So uh, grid tie is an important piece in this. Um, that it requires us to be connected to BC Hydro and selling it back to them. But battery storage systems are really important and there's great research and development on the planet right now towards some of the uh, types of energy. Uh, Arno himself has a Tesla wall battery in, in his place. So my cabin out at Salmon Beach, I've got 12, that, that are, uh, 12 batteries that are about this high that run about the length of this stage here. And that gives me enough juice that I can go up there and be relatively comfortable off the grid. Arno's got one box on the wall, you know, and he's running a house that's four or five times the size from it. So that's pretty unique, although he is tied to the grid, so he has the opportunity to pull on BC Hydro there. But there's so many new emerging technologies that we need to watch for in there. The picture on the right is Arno's Tesla wall battery, by the way. So water. First thing we want to do, like energy, is you conserve. That's principle one. Reduce the volumes that you need. We use specialized faucets and stuff that reduce the volumes of water that comes out. Then the amount of water that we need is dramatically reduced in there. 
down in places like California where water is so dear to the people there, they've already got a lot of that tech. How about a programmable shower where you actually punch in your number and you walk into the shower and you get a light mist so that you get wet, it stops. You then soap yourself down and within a, uh, 30 seconds, whatever you've set it at, whoosh, now you got a rinse. You can go and have a full shower and use a fraction of the amount of water that it would take if you just crank the valve on and just let it flow as many of us would. That becomes a critical piece for that. You also wanna be concerned about collecting rainwater and where can we use that uh, in there. And so our ability to collect rainwater and use it for the non-potable uses minimizes our need for having to uh, purify it. But we can meet Canadian drinking water standards with rainwater, it's not a problem in there. So rainwater harvesting becomes a strong option for us. And then of course, it's all about being able to store as much rain. The issue here, and what's really unique, is that in November, there is enough rain in this part of the world in November that if we didn't get another drop for 11 months and we had the ability to capture all that rain, it would meet our own personal needs if our cisterns were big enough. So we have the resources here, we just need the the vision as to how to do that. Here's a, uh, an image of a building and you can look down in the very bottom. Rather than big plastic cisterns that sit outside your house and might be somewhat unsightly, we bury them under the garage, under the slab of the garage so that they're out of sight. They're still easily to access. All three of Arno's uh, cisterns are under the floor of his garage in the, in the Van Art house in, in Yellow Point. We have two 10,000 gallon ones there and they don't need any other water supply. Food, we have the ability to look at growing some of our own food, whether it's permaculture gardens that surround our houses, allow us to go out and get the herbs and vegetables and stuff that we want for our meals. They're fresh, they're, they're tastier for us and they're healthier for us in that process. But we also have the opportunity to explore hydroponics and aquaponics and the ability to use sun spaces to grow some of our food inside of there and to do starter plants so that we can transfer them outside and get them an earlier start after the frost uh, in there as well. So really important to be thinking about our ability to grow our own food and then we need to think about our wastes and compost, etc. So we are taking our waste and we're uh, allowing that to become soil again for us so we can use that to help our food production in there. Now it's really unique because there are opportunities to get into more innovative septic systems out there and we'll speak about that in a moment because I'm going to give you an example here of a project that uh, I'm involved in that we considered uh, innovative septic systems. And uh, ultimately there's the possibility of composting toilets and uh, grey water separation there as well. And then there's companionship and there's the importance of bringing people together so that we can work collectively on the challenges that we have. This is an image here of a charrette that I ran for a green neighborhood up in the Cedar area uh, on the island here. And uh, those are the individuals, many of them professionals uh, with expertise and many of them citizens of that neighborhood as we came together to discuss about how we could create a green neighborhood that would work for everyone. So I want to just touch very quickly on this because I have spent uh, so much of my career working on the one-offs, working with Arno and Linda or similar clients to create a house that they could live somewhat self-sufficient within it or, or at least approaching reliance within there. What is missing there is the next stage, bringing all those people together and doing it in community, doing it as a green neighborhood. And this is the part that really, really excites me on this. So it gives us opportunities when we are developing a piece of property. How many here would be familiar with our eco village as an example, okay? Our eco village, I was the agent for the zoning amendment for that project. We were working forward to create the first eco village in Canada. When we went in there, they had wetlands that needed to be protected. They had some great farm area that we wanted to identify. There was an access location there where we were concerned about being able to meet all of the 
um, uh, the access of people coming to visit, etc., within there. So the ability for us to look at that collectively and to cluster the housing in one area allowed us to protect some of those areas at the Eco Village. So clustered residential becomes an element of green neighborhoods that makes sense. We have the opportunities to have communal systems. Geothermal, the ability or geo exchange is the proper term for it. It's the ability to draw heat from the ground or from a water body and bringing that up. In a one-off situation, that's about $40,000 on average for a typical residence. In a green neighborhood, we can have one system that connects to multiple homes in there. In the project that I'm going to speak to in a moment, we got a quote in there of between twelve and fourteen thousand dollars per household to be connected to Geo Exchange. Now, because of just biofiber and the lack of need for heat, I'm not even sure we're going to even need to explore that because passive solar gives us that solution for our heating requirements in there in many ways. So economies of scale are an important element that green neighborhoods give us. And we have the opportunity to share in our labor, to share um, our resources in, in there as well. So we can do things in larger groups in there. I'm not sure. I know Francis reached out to see if there was um, any politicians in our community that might be interested in this conversation today. And so if there is a few in this room or if, you, if there aren't and you know some, Pass this on. It's really important. In, in the official community plan for electoral area A in the regional district in Nanaimo, they identified an eight and a half acre piece of property. And they said that we will designate this for a model sustainable neighborhood. They offered it all kinds of density and they said you need to put in alternative septic systems, alternative road systems, energy conservation, water conservation, all of those green elements are dictated into that. And so that property will only be developed that way because the planners are restricted. They can't let a conventional subdivision come onto that piece of property. Use your OCPs and make sure that those designations get put into them. So here's a project at the regional district in Nanaimo. And I'm just going to jump to the next one there. In the middle of that, you'll see fruit and nut. Uh, it says fruit and nut tree orchard. What we've done here is we are looking at a biodigester as our means of handling the human waste. And that, instead of just flushing it off, is, is now being seen as a resource. So using the biodigester, we get a sludge, which can mix with other composting materials as a fertilizer for gardens, okay? It has a, a, a biogas coming off of it that we can burn off to heat water and then use that water to heat the community buildings. And, and more importantly, it gives off a fluid that is nutrient rich that we can pump underground into a septic area. So that fruit and nut tree orchard there is our septic field. And it's a nutrient rich uh, uh, fluid that is going in to help power the fruit and nut trees in there. So now our septic field, instead of just being this waste area, is now actually a production area within the context of green neighborhood. So I bring to your attention our choices around development. This first image there is what is a conventional subdivision. Actually, it's quite ironic because the developers behind that came to me and said, Jack, we want to do the greenest neighborhood in all of Nanaimo and we hear you're the guy. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, sounds great. I'll work with you on this. And then they said, come on up. We'll show you what we've done. We've got the property ready. Look at that. Center line of the road, 100 feet each way, they have stripped out anything that is alive. You will not find an earthworm in that soil there. They have absolutely destroyed it. And that is the standard approach to suburbia. Instead of coming in and saying, why don't we put in narrow road systems of permeable pavers in there? Why don't we look at the different options that we can do in the nature of a green neighborhood? So the bottom image there is showing what that might look like if we protected the trees and stuff that are there. 
and, and instead of going and bulldozing everything, there is so much more we can do in the way of green neighborhoods. Here's another project. This one has sewer and water, so it's a slightly different, we don't have to worry about our septic challenges and stuff on there. This is a project, and I don't know how many might be familiar with the Quamanchin Inn site on Maple Bay Road in Duncan. Fantastic old building, spectacular inn. 2016, burnt to the ground. It was lost. The property is being developed and it was a very special place in the Cowichan Valley and I'm hoping this is where we wanna go with that. So, so what we've done there is the green area is what we call a greenway. And, and basically it is a tract of land that we're gonna plant fruit trees, nut trees, berry bushes and call it a snack track. And all of the houses look across that at each other, okay? So everybody is living within face to face without an automobile between the neighbors in there. And yet with the parking in the center structure there, nobody is more than 30 meters from their front door. So it's not a great distance to have to walk. And many of the homes actually, for those that need uh, to be able to park right in their home, there is some that will have direct access in there. And that's particularly important for the disabled within our, our community as well. But that greenway gives us the opportunity to do attached housing all the way around there. So we are in the process of chasing a zoning amendment on that property to do a model green neighborhood in there. Here's an image here that shows what the buildings would look like. And we're talking about eco architecture. Now eco architecture to be different from say West Coast modern or uh, some other style. It's really what we're talking about is optimizing roof slopes and sun and glass on there so that we can collect the sun where we can in every possible way. And there's some images of the street, the uh, parking area on the top. If we're gonna park cars in the middle, then let's build a big raised uh, garden area above that and, and, and surround it with solar panels. And there you can see the greenway in the bottom right hand corner. So as I come to conclusion here, I can say that for the sake of our grandchildren's future, starting today, we could reach individual and neighborhood self-reliance on this island if we combined our divine gift of creativity and imagination with existing and emerging technologies to create resilient communities focused on meeting our basic needs. We can do that now. It can happen. So thank you very much for your time.